Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures, and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Want breakthrough ideas? Try the game of innovation with our guest, David Cutler. David, thanks for being with us today. Thanks so much. I'm excited to chat with you. Now, taking apart the title, what does the word innovation really mean? My definition is very simple. Innovation is extraordinary problem solving. Whether you need to reimagine the past or invent the future, whether you're trying to stop the pain or seize fresh treasure, innovation is about extraordinary problem solving. Now, when we think of someone solving a problem, I, I, I guess I've watched too many movies growing up or sitcoms. But I think of that scientist who no two articles of clothing match. He has two different (laughs) socks on. His hair is kind of wild and bushy, but he's the one who comes up with ideas. Is, Is innovation something we're born with or do we develop it over the years? That's a really good question. I think there is this, I I hear this from a lot of people, this notion that innovators are born, not made. It's as if the great heavens above opened up and decreed, thou shalt be a brilliant innovator. And the rest of you poor schmucks, well, you're (laughs) destined to a life of average normalcy. The, (laughs) The truth of the matter is that innovation is a skill like any other that can and must be cultivated. And I guess today more than ever, I mean, we know that we go into a store and we just get used to one product and things change. And I know you say in your book, change is the only guarantee. And, and I actually wrote that in my notes because it's so true. I mean, mm-hmm. if we get used to things and I'm someone who likes to get used to where the buttons are here or when this show comes on, but it's going to change in six months. There's a new dial. There's a new system. There's a new way of doing it. So uh, whether we like it or not, it's going to happen. Yeah, and if it changes in six months, the next time it might change in four months. Change is happening at an exponential rate. And I think it shakes a lot of us up and almost puts us on, I'm going to say, kind of an uncertain cliff for a lot of us, especially as we get older. As we cultivate innovation, are there things we should know about it? And before we even go into the essence of this show, um, what would you tell someone who's listening to, to kind of prepare for this? Should they have a pen in hand? Should they just listen? Should they be taking notes? I think it'd be great to to have a pen in hand in case anything sticks with you and we can talk about some specific strategies. Now, in a business setting, most employees, I would assume, and I, I, I think this is realistic, aren't paid to be innovators. We, we don't say to them, by the way, we want you to come up with ideas. We want you to be a good receptionist, good lawyer, good teacher, but don't reinvent the wheel because we're going to have problems then. Is that a good policy or is that something that's changing? Well, of course, it depends upon what your goals are. But with the definition of extraordinary problem solving, you know, many jobs, the title describes a problem to be solved, a fundraiser, a teacher, a marketer. But you're right that a lot of in a lot of positions, the ideas follow the script. You know, it's a franchisable type model. And your job is to not deviate from something. When it comes to consistency, that might be uh, the, the path. You know, Disney is an example of this an extremely innovative company. It has these Imagineers whose role is to think of new ways to engage people and create uh, amazing experiences. And yet folks who work in the park, if you're dressed up as a character or something, there are very, very clear scripts to follow. That said, if there are creative challenges to solve, sometimes it's so important to have a diversity of personalities at the table And sometimes those folks with a front row seat will have insights that a CEO or someone else at the top just certainly wouldn't have that same perspective. And that's something I wanted to get at because the, let's say the classroom teacher, as opposed to the administrator, they know what's going on in that classroom. They are sitting there all day, six hours with the children on and off. They see them at recess at play and they can see the looks on their faces and a good teacher picks up those things. Uh, Same thing for, uh, I'll say, uh, someone who is uh, doing housekeeping in a building. They can see what the people either like, dislike, they hear them talking. Uh, Do we overlook a great source of innovation by not uh, bringing those people into the fold? Often, and for a number of reasons. 
one thing that happens in a lot of organizations, okay, it's time to innovate. It's time to do something new. So maybe the boss, the CEO, or select group of leaders get together and they come up with some ideas, some innovations that are then imposed upon the community. First of all, it's unlikely that the leader is going to have all of the best ideas, right? Or that that small group is going to be able to have that kind of perspective, as you mentioned, that the people on the front lines might have. But even if they do come up with the best ideas, it turns out people do not like being told what to do, especially if it's different from what they've ever done before. So I see in many cases, sometimes uh, these leaders will come up with some ideas. You and I might even really think they're great ideas, but then they tell people what to do. And maybe it takes, but morale plummets. People push back. They retreat. They quit their job. You know, maybe that's part of it, part of the great resignation. And when you bring people into the process of solving a problem and saying that your voice and your opinions matter, not only can it help you come up with better solutions, but it builds a greater sense of buy-in and ownership. I remember once when I was dealing in the corporate world and I was an officer of the company, I said to someone, gee, I thought the controller was a good person and made good decisions. And this person gave me an insight because they said, Bill, that's the way he treats you because you're so-called his equal on the uh, strategy, on the uh, stair step uh, scale. They said, but to the rest of us, he doesn't treat us that way. And of course, I didn't realize I'm looking at it through my eyes, not theirs, and we have different viewpoints. Um, with, With that in mind, if I was hiring you as a consultant, Would you say to me it's better to, let's say we have a 20-person accounting firm or law firm, to bring in an outside view to see what's, you know, the weak spots, or should we start internally to innovate? Are you talking about in terms of a facilitator of the process or in terms of what I call the puzzlers, the people that are solving the problem? I guess solving the problem. or And maybe both of you, you know, you're the expert. You tell me what, where I would be best off doing it. Well, in terms of leading processes, you know, I work with lots of organizations from all kinds of sectors, and I'm not necessarily the expert in the in in the field and the problem. I'm an expert on process. Okay. And so Good often, point. before we even do anything, before we even get people in the room to talk about the problem, I'll be meeting with someone who's in in the firm in some way and talking about things. And because I'm not an expert, I don't need to know all the minutia, but I need to know enough to be able to create what I call an innovation game, right? To create a process that's going to help them solve the problem. And so I ask lots of questions so that I can understand what it is. And what happens quite often is that people are so close to the issue, you know, we call it the curse of knowledge, that it's actually hard for them to explain some of the basic premises And I'll ask questions. They'll be like, oh, I never even really thought about it that way to break it down to really the essence of what it is. And if it's hard for someone to explain it to me, it might be hard for them to clearly uh, be on the same page with many of their colleagues and and the likes. So I do think for that reason, it's helpful to work through something without getting trapped in the weeds. In terms of facilitating a process, being an outsider I don't have a you know fist in the fight, so I'm not threatening in that way. It's a lot easier because I, I'm not to blame or I don't get any credit for any of the good or bad things that happened in the past. And so I think having that kind of neutrality is helpful for running the process of an innovation game or any kind of change management. In a lot of ways, it's like a referee. You can't have a referee who's on the team. That wouldn't work as well. So you need to have this neutral figure to guide the process. And then finally, when you, when you ask about the people that are solving the problem, I call it the puzzlers, the people on that team. Diversity is, is so important because everyone gets stuck when problem solving, but different kinds of people hit that wall at different parts of the process. So I can't tell you as a blanket statement who exactly should be in the room until we know what is the kind of problem we're, we're, we're attempting to solve. But as a rule of thumb, if it's a creative problem, right? If it's just a logistical challenge, it might be a different question. But if it's a creative challenge, it's often very helpful to get people who intersect with that problem on very different levels. So they care about it, they're passionate about it, but they bring different perspectives. 
David, at this point in the show, I'd like to let our listeners know that if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHBC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Today, we're talking to David Cutler. He's the author of The Game of Innovation. David, we're going to ask you where we can get the book and if there's a website where we can learn more information. Well, you can get the book anywhere that books are sold on Amazon or Barnes & Noble or anywhere else. Uh, Our website is www.thepuzzlercompany.com forward slash book. That's where you would find out information about the book. Thepuzzlercompany.com forward slash book. And this is a very visual book. Now, that may, that may sound funny because how else are you going to read a book? But you have a lot of uh, simple diagrams that bring things out. It makes it pleasant to read. Uh, it hits us with blurbs on different pages so that we're not overwhelmed with information because you're the expert on it. And sometimes experts get a little too deep. They, they like the minutia, but we just want to solve the problem and we want to be a little more innovative and uh, learn from people like yourself. Now, I think it's early in the book, around pages 12 and 13, there are warning signs. And I I don't recall this coming up in too many books. So tell us why there are warning signs and what you're warning us about. Well, the the warnings that are there are uh, addressing some common mythologies that happen when people maybe pick up a book. And the first warning here is most who advocate innovation haven't seen it in action. And that's something that I see in lots of firms. Innovation is such a buzzword. And yet you can tell often from walking in the doors of an organization uh, how innovative the company is just by how the space looks or how they meet and the kinds of sessions they have. So some of the other warnings are just about how Once you engage in an innovative process, how it can change your worldview, your team, and your meetings. That's one of the things that I think meetings are often viewed as these unfortunate but necessary evils (laughs) in many communities that, well, nobody likes the meeting, but I guess you got to go because that's part, part of the job. I think that the meeting has potential to be the highlight of your week if approached in a certain way. That's when your talent convenes. That's when you can make the most progress if you design it instead of as a brain dump, as a lecture at worst, and question and answer at best, as an opportunity for teams to work together and solve problems. Without telling us any names, because you brought up an interesting point there, are there any stories you can tell us or something you noticed immediately upon walking into a business that would be uh, helpful and instructive to us, the audience? Sure. Well, let me just address the issue of physical space, because I think physical space does a lot to impact the culture. And it's one of the most overlooked resources in America or in the world. And so I go into lots of places. It might be a spectacular, very fancy place, or it might be an awful falling apart place. But oftentimes you look at the walls and they're just white or they're uh, you know, uh, they're bare, or maybe they have some pictures that are nice, but not particularly relevant. Uh, so I, just think about the potential of a wall. You know who gets walls really well, who has great insights about this? Kindergarten teachers. <laughs> and what kindergarten teachers understand is that walls are places to, for, one, forecast values, two, celebrate creativity, And three, highlight voices from within the community. And so when you walk into most kindergarten classrooms, you feel like creativity is here. Experimentation is here. Creative geniuses are part of this community. And when you walk into most Fortune 100 companies, you feel like, wow, they spent a lot of money on this place. Do they have any creative ideas? So creativity looks a certain way. Innovation feels a certain way. And you can see that from the space. Now, we all all know teachers are creative, but I I never heard of the thought in that context. And and you might have seen me, I'm taking notes and writing all this down because they might, obviously they have to capture the students' interests, especially the younger students who can, you know, if they see a bird going by that you can lose them completely because they're out there watching the bird or the dog or uh, a bumblebee in back of the room. Are they especially good at this or is there any one, uh, I guess you could call it a class or um, occupation that's really good at creativity? I'm sure that there are some, some, you know, I'm an artist and artists are known for creative output. But I love your, your point and your question looking at 
the teacher. I want to go back to something that you said a little bit earlier, uh, just to tie all these points together. So, you know, you were asking about if, if, if a company is trying to solve a problem, should they, should they go and also invite people who are on the ground floor? But sometimes it's really helpful to invite someone from a totally different sector. You know, innovation is not usually about reinventing the wheel. It's about taking an idea from one place and applying it somewhere else. So you have to go to another world in order to get another idea. And what would be spectacular might be, depending on the problem, if, for example, if a business is trying to figure out how do we create a more innovative culture, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll talk amongst themselves or invite other business leaders. They might want to invite a kindergarten teacher who might have insights that they never would because they're, they're, they're working within a creative culture every single day. And I love that because, again, I never thought of the teacher. I have great respect for them. I was a teacher. My wife taught. But I never thought of them as the person you'd bring in for creativity. And yet they have to do this, especially the younger ones where you're dealing with a kindergarten, first or second grade, where you have to change every few minutes to keep them interested or have them do something silly or laugh or get them involved. Uh, They might be the most naturally able to do this. Let's put it that way. So... Um, Maybe. And, you know, the opposite could be true also. Schools are places that have lots of challenges and they've been exacerbated through COVID and so many things. And a lot of times when schools go to solve their problems, sometimes it happens the administrator, sometimes they bring in the teachers, but it could be really valuable to, you know, if we're having a hard time, whatever the challenge is, engaging our students or, uh, or, or you know, shrinking inequities that have emerged, to look in other sectors and other industries to bring in people who have solved this problem for a different audience before and be able to learn from them. So it really works both ways. We are all in this thing together and everyone has something to offer. David, I'm just thinking because you, you mentioned uh, the, the COVID in there. Um, we, of course, when we think of COVID, we think of Zoom as being the uh, new device that has uh, risen to the forefront for businesses, saved us driving to work, allowed us to work from home, convenient, etc. cetera. Um, are there any other things that you've seen or innovations that's come about or maybe in process that you can even talk about as a result of the COVID pandemic? I love this. I love this question. You know, I'm an innovator to my core. Yet I am not nearly as creative as COVID-19. You know, never could I have imagined a world in which you'd have to wear masks and stand six to 12 feet apart from one another where it was safer outside than, than inside. I, I, you know, and I don't mean to belittle the very serious uh, consequences of, you know, many people died from this or have been very, very sick. But, but from an innovation perspective or a societal perspective, I view COVID as, as a worthy adversary. What COVID did almost overnight is it changed the game, right? It changed the game. And when you change the game, you change the rules and you change the ways that we operate. And it is true that, you know, when you ask a lot of organizations, well, what was the good thing that came out of uh, the COVID period? People will say, well, we learned to use Zoom, which, you know, it took an international pandemic for people to open up to readily available technology in many places. Uh, but I love to think beyond that. I can give you one example. Uh, I'm, an, I, I'm actually a musician by training. Uh, and the question in COVID, when essentially every concert performance venue across the globe was closed down, is what use does the world have for artists and for musicians at this point? We can't give you a shot. We can't cure you from this thing. So why does the world need us? And I think we... We celebrated the nurses, we celebrated the teachers, so many of these other professions, but what can we do? And what I realized is that what musicians can do is we can tell stories and we can celebrate folks and we bring together communities and the likes. So one of the things actually that, that, that one of my communities did is a big innovation that we have COVID to thank is we put together uh, a program called Celebrating Local Heroes where we went through a process of identifying 10 professions that were on the front lines of COVID-19. We paired each of them with a composer and a performing ensemble. Uh, We recorded these video vignettes about their experiences that were then scored by the composer and recorded by the ensemble. 
We scheduled concerts all around our community aboard something uh, called the concert truck, which is a mobile concert venue so that we could be safe outside. And then we had a final culminating community conversation that utilized music and other tactics to facilitate conversation with these people who were, to go to your point, these were not the CEOs, these were frontline workers. And it changed, I think, all of us who are involved. Now, every time you, one of the professions we <laughs> celebrated were truck drivers. And the truck driver, he said, you know, when you're on the freeway and there's a truck and it slows down and you get really annoyed and you just wish it would get out of your life. And it's, he said, that's me. And at that point, he said, that's, that's me driving the truck. I'm bringing toilet paper to your local grocery store. <laughs> and of course, now it could be baby formula or whatever it is, right? They're a central part of the community. And it just changed the way I think so many of us look at one another as human beings and a central part of this puzzle called life. That, that's a great point because absolutely true. If they're bringing something that all of a sudden is needed and d during parts of history, it's either the toilet paper, the food, the protective uh, uh, devices that we needed during the pandemic. And that truck driver is one of the most important people in the world because it's in his truck. And if he doesn't drive yeah. safely, yeah. it's not going to get to the destination. Before I ask you more questions, though, David, I'd like to, again, let our audience know, if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan. Our guest today is David Cutler. He's the author of The Game of Innovation. And David, again, we're going to ask you where we can get the book and the website where we can find out more of this information. Yeah, you can get the book on Amazon or anywhere books are found. And our website is thepuzzlercompany.com forward slash book. As you mentioned before, The Game of Innovation is it, it's so different from my other book projects, which are in most books that you get, which are word books. This is a visual book. So it's printed in full color. I worked with an illustrator and a designer so that it would not only talk about innovation, but look like innovation and feel like innovation. I, I, it was an amazing process. Well, you bring out that point. And again, you've got me thinking now, just talking about that truck driver, how many occupations maybe I don't give enough credit to for various reasons, just because sometimes they're unseen. They pass you on the road, but you don't particularly see the, the truck driver as you would a receptionist or a waiter or uh, your lawyer or doctor or someone like that. So uh, you, you've already alerted me. Now, when you go into a group and if they ask you for some of your advice or just to consult on how to innovate, do you give them a problem first to show them the strengths and weaknesses or do you warn them, don't do these 10 things because everybody makes these mistakes and I've seen it happen too often? How do you handle that company? Well, of course, it depends upon how much time I have with them. But I know I'm thinking of an example. I went into an organization and it was my first you know, two hours with them or something. And they asked, well, what ideas do you have for us that we should do? And you know, who am I to go into someone else's community and tell them what to do? I am an innovator and I am an idea person. But when I'm playing the role of a facilitator, or I, I call it a game master within the context of innovation games. When I'm playing that role, more important than the solutions, my job is to ask the questions, the, the, the provocative questions that will get the people who are part of that community to come up with the great solutions uh, so that they will really own what is said. How you ask the question impacts the answer. This is one innovation trick. How you ask the question impacts the answer. Most people ask boring questions, and as a result, they get boring answers. You know, the most, the least inspired of all is, here's the problem. What, what should we do? And it's not necessarily a, a bad problem. I mean, that's probably why you're convened in the first place, but it's not particularly inspired as a question. But if you ask a crazy question, you might come up with a crazy answer. If you ask an intriguing question, you might come up with an intriguing question answer. So instead of what should we do for dinner tonight, you might ask, what should we do for dinner tonight? That'll make us laugh uncontrollably in 10 years, right? Has a very different feel. We'll come up with different uh, solutions to that. And that brings forth another question to a lot of people, I would think, especially in a business setting, I would, and again, maybe this is totally wrong, but I would think like 85% of the people say, what's the problem? We want to make more money. We want more revenue or we want more income. Uh, do we look at the wrong problem and we're trying to solve one thing when 
the the problem might be the door doesn't open and the people are dying to get in, but we just can't get the door open and get them through it, or we don't have enough people to handle the inflow. Such a great question. That is so often the problem. The problem number one is to solve the right problem, right? To play the right game. And so much of the time, you know, we talk a lot about time management, both individually and with the organizations and time management is very important within the context of an innovation game. Time management is very important, but I think just as much about project management, right? What is the problem we need to solve first? And so much of the time we get that wrong. We solve the less important problem or the less impactful problem. I think one thing about great leaders, great organizations, great entrepreneurs is having the insight to know the difference between an opportunity and a distraction. And I think the most successful individuals and organizations often make opposite decisions from many of the rest of us. I I love that. In fact, I'm jotting it down as fast as you've got my page already filled with notes. But the difference between an opportunity and a distraction, and I think so many of us just, uh, I'll admit it, I certainly do. I'll get carried off because of some minor point and when I, if I have time to reflect or look at the big pictures, why did I waste that much time doing that? I guess like most of us when we're on the computer, just scrolling through or looking at uh, different websites. David, this has been really revealing and uh, so much fun. I, the book is so good. And I think for anybody listening, I think they'd love to talk to you. They'd get a hundred new ideas. But let me go back and ask you again before we wrap up. Tell us the website and where we can get your book. Website is thepuzzlercompany.com forward slash book. Thepuzzlercompany.com forward slash book. That's my radio voice. (laughs) And we're talking about the the game of innovation. And our guest has been, and of course, is the author of the book, David Cutler, C-U-T-L-E-R. David, thank you so much for being with us today. We'd like to let our audience know that you've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success.